because uh, of time uh, we need to move on to uh, the next talk. So um, the next speaker is uh, uh, Shiraini Sriskandam. I, I hope that it was <laughs> close to how your name is pronounced. Could you please uh, share your slides? Um, is that okay? Yeah, and uh, um, um, Shiraini will present uh, on the uh, track transmission of COVID-19 in kids study, and she's uh, from Imperial College London. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for organizing this meeting. And I am a fish out of water. I'm not a mathematician. I'm an infectious disease um, academic and biologist. So apologies. So this might not be quite what you're expecting. So the track study was intended to examine um, transmission of coronavirus in kids but it started as a completely different study before the pandemic looking at scarlet fever transmission uh, as a contact tracing study in schools and this was because there'd been an enormous ups whoops upsurge in scarlet fever in english schools in the period of time between 2014 and 2018 with about 19,000 cases in 2016 associated with an upsurge in invasive diseases and also new variants of group a streptococcus which is the causative agent and that's what i normally work on so we did a contact tracing study in schools in 2018 and 2019 looking at transmission of group a strep asking is there transmission to asymptomatic classmates from a confirmed index case and are school infection prevention interventions adequate I'm not going to talk about this study in any great detail, but you can see that there are great similarities between what we wanted to do for this study and what we probably should have done for COVID-19 right at the start. And we did, um, so these notified cases were statutorily notified, so we knew about them. And we went into the classrooms affected and did um, weekly visits to swab all of the children who were consenting into the study to find out, are they carrying the outbreak strain. We genome sequenced all the strains we found. And if any child was positive, we didn't tell anybody because asymptomatic carriage of group A streptococcus isn't notifiable and is currently not treated in the UK. And we didn't know what we were expecting. What we found was really quite shocking. So this is a class of five-year-olds exposed to a case of scarlet fever. And it's the same children shown in week one, week two, week three. And you can see 44% of the children shown in dark pink carried a genomically identical strain to the outbreak strain by the second week by about day eight. So there was a large scale transmission. This is a normal classroom of children with no COVID intervention. So this is from 2018. So this is what will normally happen with a bacterial infection that is transmitted by respiratory transmission, allegedly by contact transmission. But remember, this was being transmitted despite interventions. And what we found was that surface swabs were very rarely positive in these classrooms, but settle plates, air settle plates placed well above the head height of the children were frequently positive, suggesting airborne dispersal of this bacterium. So just to summarize what we found, that there was a transmission of around 27 to 27% of the children in the class by that second week when we looked at six different classrooms. There was fabulous participation by these children, over 50%, which is very good for English studies. And um, in contrast, outbreak, non-outbreak strains were only carried by about 2% of children. Cleaning was adequate, but airborne dispersal seemed likely to be a problem. And what we found was that scarlet fever cases plummeted during the pandemic, and I guess you can imagine why. So fast forward um, to um, March 2020, what we wanted to do was to find out whether COVID-19 was transmitted to the same degree in classrooms. Remember that we already knew that H1N1 influenza had caused a secondary attack rate of around about 27% in non-immune children. So we thought this was interesting that group A streptococcus and influenza seem to have similar secondary attack rates when you looked at them by contact tracing. And what we wanted to do was to find single index cases of PCR confirmed COVID-19 in a school child who had been in school on the day of their positive test and then forensically test all of their friends to find out whether they were infected or not to see if the secondary attack rate was similar to influenza or strep pyogenes. We also did case contact tracing within the households 
and we did surface and air sampling for SARS-CoV-2 to find out were precautions adequate. And this study was done um, on a relatively modest budget, but in collaboration with um, UK HSA, Public Health England. Uh, so, of course, although there were many similarities to our scarlet fever study, there were also many differences. First of all, we had to, by law, notify the positive cases we found. We were not allowed to keep the results to ourselves. And secondly, as you know, uh, almost immediately as we planned the study, the schools were closed. So we had to replan our study to do it when schools reopened in the autumn of 2020. Uh, despite numerous operational challenges, which I don't have time to go into, I'm sure you can all imagine what those would have been. But there was rapidly changing guidance throughout the summer of 2020 about what would happen in schools. Previously, there had been quarantine of close contacts, social distancing in classes that had opened in the June of uh, 2020. And that was just, um, I think, uh, children doing exams in year six in primary school and hand hygiene. But what rapidly became the case was the smaller bubbles that we were knowing about, which is the children who were in contact with index cases, just got very, very big, uh, according to government guidance. And by September 2020, there were already plans for entire bubbles of up to 300 children in big secondary schools to be sent home if there was a positive case. And this was not policy. This was just interpretation of how the guidelines were implemented. And not only were the children sent home instantly, they were sent home instantly, often by text message, leaving very little room for investigators like ourselves to gain consent for those children before they got sent home to take part in the study. And then, of course, as you know, separate stories that schools were closed again in for three months in early 2021. Uh, after the alpha variant came into um, circulation. It wasn't a full school closure, and actually most of the schools in London were open with roughly 50% capacity. But when the schools came back in March 2021 with a number of interventions in secondary schools, school head teachers and parents were super fed up, and they really did not want to take part in very much research. So we had to adapt our study over time. And rather than having single large bubbles, we had to accept that we were only ever going to get into the study children from multiple bubbles, even though they'd all individually been ex exposed to a child in class. The participation rate in London schools for this study amongst bubbles was only 8.8%, which is a stark contrast to what we found in the Scarlet Fever study, where over 50% of children participated. So we also um, decided to recruit children from adjacent classes who were not sent home. So not the identical bubble, but the adjacent class, either because it was a parallel year group or they were geographically next door to the other, other classroom. And you've seen from those beautiful network diagrams in earlier talks that there is a lot, a lot of mixing in, um, in schools. And the participation, participation rate amongst those children was more like 22%. And we also had very good participation from the index case households because they were at home anyway and stuck and had nothing else to do. So they quite liked being part of a study. So what actually happened in the bubbles? And just to orientate you, these are individual bubbles for individual it's eight schools. And these are bubbles followed over a four week period uh, and um, in different settings. And this is early part of the study when, remember, people were sent home for 14 days from class if they were in a bubble that um, was affected by a, a case. And then later on, it became 10 days of isolation and we began to have the circulation of the Alpha or Kent variant. And then towards the end of our study, at the end of the school year of 2021, the Delta variant was circulating. So for the first and second weeks, all of these children were at home and having to be visited at home. By the third week, they were back in school. What we found was that the bubbles from these eight schools had no detected transmission. But of course, you can see from these numbers, these avatars I'm showing you, that because of the low participation rate, we have very low confidence to say there was no transmission detected. We can be confident that the at secondary attack rate in these bubbles was well below the 25% rate we detected for scarlet fever or reported for influenza. But of course, there were remarkably um, many uh, interventions during this time, as you know about, which is social distancing, no mask wearing, 
and uh, lots of hygiene precautions. We were able to use um, statutory notification data to confirm, certainly up until the period of April 2021, that there were no new notifications of cases in these postcodes amongst children. So we can also be use that data to inform our study. Household visits, these were not very glamorous um, uh, visits, were made to the cases. And just to give you an idea, we, I'm not gonna go through this data in any detail. The cases um, looked like this, basically they were children who had active viral replication and active shedding, and they seroconverted during the course of the study. And we had primary age children and we had secondary age children. There, there were really not many differences, but there were not that many um, uh, cases that we followed. So what happened to the households of these index cases? Remember, these are the same index cases that were uh, in the bubbles, caused the bubbles to go home. Of 35 household contacts who were negative before the study started, 10 of those household contacts became infected after the child. Importantly, of those 10, four of them could be refuted as being transmitted by the child using genome sequencing. So there was definite transmission to just six of the 35 household contacts, but that was still 17% secondary attack rate due to children, which was way more than had been predicted by some of my pediatric colleagues who were concerned that children were not vectors of transmission at all. If we included those who had tested themselves before we arrived in their household, but we um, asked them about when they tested positive or when their symptoms started, we were able to infer that actually 13 of 47 household contacts were infected by the index case children. That's 27.7%. So we've got a definite level of 17% and a likely level of 27% secondary attack rates caused by children in the household. So very different to the bubble. So what about the control classrooms? So these were children who didn't have to go home and isolate. Well, we had 63 pupils that we followed here. So a lot better um, participation rate. And in seven of the eight schools, we found no new cases when we followed these children up. Except in one case, and you can see these three children shown in pink, um, who had tested negative in the previous week, but suddenly tested positive. And I just want to drill down to those three. They were asymptomatic and it was a surprising event. Of course, the whole class then got sent home, making us very unpopular. And those three um, children, they were teenagers, if we look at one of them, that child had a reasonably high copy number that she was shedding. When we looked at her household, four days later, her, her viral load had risen to 6 million and she transmitted the virus to a sibling with whom she shared a bedroom. Uh, but unlike her, the other two had very low uh, viral copy numbers, e.g. as a COVID um, gene. These levels, and you will see in a moment, are similar to what we might detect in the environment, but they are high enough to trigger a positive result in statutory notification terms. So they were declared positive, their households had to isolate as well. When we looked at one of them sequentially, that child was never positive again. There was absolutely no environmental detection of COVID-19 around that child. Um, and we have no reason to believe that those were genuine infections, that they are called as positive and will have been called as positive by Lighthouse Lab results as well. So I think this illustrates an important point that transient mucosal contamination in the company of somebody who is strongly positive is possible. So I just want to say something briefly about the environmental sampling we did, because I think this is quite an important part of our study. We took environmental samples in the bubble classroom, the control classroom, and the school lose, and we measured um, virus in the air and in the surfaces, and we went into classrooms shortly after the children had vacated the classroom. Um, we used a Coriolis micron, which essentially samples the entire air of the room uh, in the time we were in the duration of time we were there, and we took five surface samples from each of the rooms, 25 centimeters squared, and we sampled the same things every visit that we made weekly visits. So what we found in schools was really remarkably little. Only around two to 4% of our surface samples in schools 
were ever positive. Remember, these were schools that had had cases. Of the air samples, only one air sample was ever positive. And that was actually in a control classroom that had not been sent home in a school where there had been two members of staff recently positive. So really very low um, incidence of finding positive results in schools. This contrasts with what we found in the households. But I just want to say something about um, this uh, business about the air sampling. Some of our critics have said, oh, well, you know, you didn't go into those classrooms when the children were there. Uh, this is um, some results from my office in a university, which was loaned to a colleague of mine who became SARS-CoV positive during the course of a working week. Five days after that office was used, 30% of the surface samples in that office were positive and the air was still positive. So I have no doubt that if the air in these classrooms had been positive, uh, we would have detected it shortly after the children had vacated. Um, so just going to the households, the results were very, very different. Again, we sampled the air and surfaces, the same surfaces in each room week by week. We looked at, at a communal room, so a sitting room, a um, bathroom and the bedroom of the case. And what we found was that surfaces were positive in 27% of the samples we took in the communal room. This would be the sitting room, or depending on the type of household. And in the case bedroom, 25%. And the, these were samples that we took. We deliberately sampled things that we thought the child might be handling, like their digital toys, soft toys, the child's bed frame, for example. And the air samples, 30% of the air samples in these communal rooms were positive when we visited. Um, so really very, very different to what we found in schools. Um, and interestingly, sample types that stayed positive for a very long time in households were the digital toys and the Nintendo DSs. And I, I guess that's simply because they weren't wiped clean. But um, we're not trying to suggest that these are vectors of transmission, more that these are parameters of viral shedding. And you can see that there's an awful lot of viral shedding that is going on in these households. Um, so just to remind you of this comparison, 2.5% on average in school surfaces contaminated versus 22% in households, 1% of air samples versus 25% of air samples in households. So we consider the, the likelihood that this was simply due to better cleaning in schools than households, and that is somehow supported by the surface human RNA contamination, looking at human 18S RNA in the surface swabs, which was significantly higher in households um, than in um, schools. I've put an inverse scale here, just um, for those of you who are familiar with PCR. But interestingly, the air samples did not show a similar difference. So there was a similar level of human RNA contamination between both households and schools, presumably because there's just lots more children in schools, even though the rooms are much bigger. So there were several learning points for COVID-19. Um, SARS-CoV transmission in schools was much less than we detected previously for scarlet fever, group A streptococcus, or that has been reported for flu. But it's obviously very likely that those implemented precautions may well be the reason, because diseases like flu and scarlet fever also disappeared during all of those precautions. But the important thing is that children clearly are able to transmit SARS-CoV-2. The household secondary attack rate was between 17 and 28 percent. So we think it's very likely that with no precautions, the school secondary attack rates would be very similar. There's no reason to think they would be any different if a bacterium and a virus, group A, strep and flu, can cause those similar transmission rates. And of course, there, we've seen this with more transmissible variants as well. The viral shedding in households was really intense and some of the environmental samples we took are markers of infection and probably markers of risk. And we think there's more advice needed to protect those who are sent into household quarantine. Certainly, we, people were sent into household quarantine in the first wave without any provision uh, of PPE and no advice whatsoever on how to protect themselves. We did find that all of the transmission in households that occurred was often based on people who were sharing bedrooms. But we do think that precautions in schools and cleaning did appear effective. And, it, you know, one might even suggest with that level of precaution, maybe we did not need to send the bubbles home at all.
Um, and we should remember that transient mucosal contamination and colonization is possible, and we need to look at that. And also that swab data, when we're thinking about transmission, is not always indicative of transmission. Remember, four of 10 samples thought to represent household transmission were refuted. So there are also lessons for future transmission research, which I think is probably the most important, my take home message from this. Um, and it might not be relevant to this particular um, grouping, but I, I do think that active contract tracing is really valuable because passive surveillance isn't accurate. But we have terrible infrastructure to do healthcare research in schools in the UK. We have no systems to contact parents and gain consent. It's much easier to conduct research in schools, not homes. People in England do not like you coming round to their houses. And we need better incentives to get schools to participate in research. But we also need better understanding of why people don't want to participate in research. The biggest barrier was the fact that people were going to get notified and entire households would need to go into isolation. And this, um, there are huge differences in research participation in England and in particular London compared with other countries, for example, Norway. So we had a participation rate in bubbles of 8.8%. In Norway, it's more like 90%. So that's something for our social science colleagues to work out for us. And just paying people money is not, is not effective. And ultimately, I think in somewhere like London, if you want to do good contact tracing research, you really need to break the link between your research results and notification and just do studies as a silent study with full anonymization. And even studies like the REACT study that Imperial um, run found a stark decline in participation over time. So I'll stop there by thanking all of my collaborators and our funders, which were UKRI and NIHR. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much.